Disclaimer, this is a long video, but I've tried my best to condense it as well as I could. The different topics I go over are shown on this side. You can skip to them if you'd like. And on that note, let's begin the video. There are lots of games I've wanted to play, but CrossCode is one I've been meaning to play for a few years actually. It's a top-down action RPG that has a lot of puzzle mechanics and platforming. It's best not to get too ahead of ourselves, so let's start from the beginning. You enter into this world and you're trying to save your brother. You fight a few enemies, do some cool attacks, finally you reach the place and... Oh. Oh, he's dead. Well, I guess it's time to discuss what this game is about. The game CrossCode is set in an MMO game called Cross Worlds, essentially a game within a game. The twist is that Cross Worlds is not virtual, it's real and it's on a planet. It's made from a mix of physical matter, the real stuff around you, and instant matter, an electronically controllable substance that is controlled from the Cross Worlds code. Oh, you can't. Oh, sorry about that, let's continue. People who play in this playground are remotely connected to this world and play as special avatars. These avatars have a physical form that is created from instant matter, and they're the ones that exist in this MMO. This is where you come in. You play as an avatar called Lee, and alongside you is a programmer called Sergei. Sergei is a character who assists you throughout your journey, starting with the initial set of tutorials. Soon after, you find out that your avatar is mute, and you are also a player who has lost their memories. It is thought that you may get your memories back by playing Cross Worlds again. Soon, Lee does arrive there, meets new friends, forms a party, and throughout her journey she reclaims bits of her memories back, slowly unraveling the main story. And that's about it. The story is a little slow after the initial section, but it does pick up a little before the halfway points of the game. It may also seem like it would have a similar story to Sword Art Online, but it's not. It pushes its story in a completely different direction. The only main similarity is that it's based on an online game with avatars. Of course there's more to discuss, but I don't want to spoil too much of the story and we need to move on. Now. Let's move over to the visuals. This game follows a modernized SNES style. If you're unsure of this era, maybe The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is a good example. It's also set in a bird's eye view, but that's not to say that it's played in the same way. Unlike other games, it includes a Z axis which creates more complex environments that require different platform levels to be designed. This is what makes platforming in this game and it works well for the most part. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> the depth of perception when it comes to platform levels are sometimes awkward. When it works, it works great. However, there are times you jump across a platform thinking it's level with you and suddenly... It's not. It's a little frustrating as you have to make your way back, but throughout my playthrough, this wasn't something that occurred frequently. For the places in this game, there are several of them. Infested locations, busy cities, incomplete areas, rivers of blood, Okay, <laughs> I lied about the last one, but the incomplete area is true. Oh, what is this anyways? These areas feel new and this is down to everything created for it. Of course not everything is new, you have the environments of the cave systems never really changing. Though there are not many cave systems in most of the areas you explore. For this reason it's not as noticeable and the different props and mobs does help this out as well. The big visual standouts, in my opinion, are the bosses, combat animations, and portraits. Starting with the bosses, it's just incredible on how much visual details are put onto these moments. Small fireballs, check. Big fireballs, check. Fire tornadoes, check. Lasers? Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. The combat animations work really well too, with the cameras usually adjusting themselves to have you see more of it. Here are two examples of special attacks you can use.
With portraits, there are a number of well-crafted expressions, especially for the main character you play as, Lee. It's actually ironic, as it makes the character with limited speech capabilities the most expressive one in the game. It really does work for a lot of moments in the game, like this one. One last thing before we move on. It's still part of visuals, so I think it counts. It's great how versatile the customization of the UI in this game is. Everything on the interface can be turned on or off, depending on what you want. If you want to make it more challenging for yourself, remove all the health bars. If you want to record something cool, turn it all off. It's so nice to have developers add features like this. It may only interest a few people, but it's a great feature nonetheless. With all of that being said, let's move over to the sounds. These are the four elements and they each have a unique sound to them. There are over 30 bosses and the majority of them have unique sounds to them. There are an uncountable number of unique enemies, all of which have a unique sound to them. <laughs> It's admirable to have them create so many unique sounds and it's those little details that make the game so much more enjoyable to play. A better example of small sound details improving gameplay are the bosses. Alright, I'm going to be bringing up a previous boss fight again, but I'm going to be highlighting the sounds instead. There are so many subtle sounds like wings flapping or the tornado of fire, and this sort of style is applied to many other battles you face in the game too. Something that helps the intensifying feeling is the music. Damn, <laughs> there is so many. You have some which focuses on the areas you're situated in, others that focus on a certain tone, and some that are just made for the characters in the game. There are too many to go through, so I'll show a few of my favorites. The music that was presented did exactly what it had to do, it never felt like it was out of place. When it needed to elevate certain emotions, it did just that. When it needed to create intensity, it was just that. You get the point. Now, that should be enough of the sounds and the music, onwards to the gameplay, and truthfully, it's quite hard to organize this one. We'll begin with the combat, after that, we'll see how it goes. There are two simple combat mechanics used, the melee and ranged combat. The melee follows a 1, 2, 3, 4 attack with a special attack created from holding the attack button. The longer you hold, the stronger this special attack is. You can also cancel a combo or a special attack. This gives a lot more freedom and it fits the whole fast paced combat system. The range attack creates a cone. During the initial stage, your attacks are less accurate, but the longer you hold it, the more precise it is. There is also a charged attack. This is a stronger attack and it can ricochet against walls forming creative ways of defeating enemies. Now for the defensive combat. Ways to avoid attacks are through dashing and blocking. Dashing can be used three times in a row to avoid attacks, whereas blocking reduces damages from attacks. If either are used at a precise time, it allows you to negate all damage towards you. For dashing, it's known as a perfect dash, and for blocking, it's a parry. In most cases, you'll be dashing to avoid attacks, but there are moments in the game where parrying is more useful. Dealing with all of these mechanics are easier on the controller, but that's not to say it doesn't have its flaws. When it comes to range attacks, it's a lot more difficult to deal with in comparison to the mouse. However, with everything else, I'd say controller works best. Even though I was fine with it and several others were fine with it, it still may frustrate a few people. Now we have an idea of the combats, I wanted to discuss about the elements in the combat trees. Over time as you play the game, you'll unlock new elements. heat. Cold, Shock, and Wave. 
These elements can be used and switched around to attack enemy weaknesses, and this is done on the fly. In other words, you can change your elemental attacks mid-battle. The game also provides you with a combat tree. It looks overwhelming initially, but it's reasonably simple and it's easy to understand once you start using it. You start with the base, the non-elemental combat tree. Over time, as you learn new elements, you also get the elemental combat tree that follows it. Each combat tree affects different aspects of your combat system, from improving combat stats to providing you with new special attacks. Another big impact towards the gameplay is the platforming in this game. It makes puzzles and bosses more creative, but the most influence it has is towards the exploration. It makes it more challenging and, well, fun. <laughs> Whenever you see a chest, it's usually at a platform level higher than you. Finding out how to get there and traveling there was the exciting and challenging part of it. In the process of doing this, sometimes you would find new places that were only accessible at a higher platform level. These locations would then interconnect with other areas and you'd find a chest you couldn't reach earlier on. This sort of design is what kept me exploring in this game, and having no jump button made it less stressful. Yeah, <laughs> no jump button. While this seems odd, it's better this way. There are so many things happening in this game, and having a jump button would just add more frustration than fun. Now for the puzzles. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a lot of it in this game. It exists in exploration, boss fights, and in dungeons. We'll go over that soon. It seems overwhelming, but the puzzles are uniquely done, and they're really well made. Let me go over the reason for this. The range attack is a big contributor to puzzle solving in this game. Instead of just pushing blocks around, you use the environment and props with your range attacks. At the very beginning, you learn to ricochet your charge attacks against walls to hit certain buttons. You are then later required to hit those shots at the right time. This tests both your puzzle and skill mechanics at the lower difficulty, which slowly increases as you progress through the game. The complexity of this also expands when you enter new dungeons. These dungeons introduce new props and have you use elemental attacks which creates new types of puzzles. The introduction to these new mechanics are also made simple. You see a bomb and you learn how to use it. You see a fire orb and you find out how to use that. Now that you have a fire element and you see a bomb, well, it's time to experiment with it. The game has you experiment and learn over time. It's a great design for puzzle mechanics. After you find out new props, elements, and learn the interactions between them, the puzzles can sometimes get very challenging and skill-reliant, but in a good way. Every puzzle makes sense and there's always room for errors. If getting the right timing gets too frustrating and you prefer just solving puzzles, you can always adjust it in the options. I mentioned dungeons earlier on, but I never discussed enough of it, so here it is. Dungeons consist of a lot of puzzles and combating. Some dungeons have you learn a new element and it builds its puzzles and combat system around that element. Other dungeon builds its puzzles and combat system around combining different elements. All of these dungeons are very long and can be very challenging. The first dungeon will probably take about 2 hours, and this is mostly down to the puzzles you go through. The later dungeons take a similar time, but they are split up more. These long dungeons may be a positive or a negative depending on how much you enjoy solving puzzles. Well, for me, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but even then, <laughs> I felt a little overwhelmed by this. I would take a break after an hour session in the dungeon and it's why I much preferred the later dungeons that were split up. The bosses in each of these dungeons are astonishing. Every time I felt I was about to enter a boss room, I was filled with excitement. And it was solely because of how fun these bosses were. This boss was part of the shock dungeon where you learned the wave element. To beat it, you would do a normal hack and slash, shooting it down, but there are openings where it uncovers its weakness. These are important moments and figuring it out was a puzzle in itself. This is replicated throughout most of their bosses and it's certainly a highlight to the dungeons you explore. I've gone over the main aspects of the gameplay, but there are other things I want to highlight too. Like this. This is such a cool design. The stores in this game tell you what items there are before talking to anyone. Items in stores cost money, but they also require ingredients. 
These ingredients are found from plants and enemy jobs. So those plants you found earlier, break them. Even the ones that are harder to reach. You're rewarded for collecting these items and some of the side quests need those items. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be an MMO game without side quests. There are a range of them in this game, from mini games like Tower of Defense quests to fetching quests. Some of the mini games can be overwhelming with the amount you have to do, even if you match the required level. In this side quest, you have to change your elements, avoid damage, protect the machine, destroy the enemies, and ensure that less than 5 enemies get through. <laughs> it isn't consistent with the difficulty of the rest of the game, but I will say that these side quests are to be taken as a challenge, and if they're too hard, it's best to come back to it at a later stage. There are also fetching quests, often these quests are completed without the realization of it. At least in my playthrough, I just broke plants as I explored and other quests often rewarded me with items that were required for that fetch quest, so it never felt like a grind for me. In fact, I don't consider this game grindy at all. I never felt the need to grind to get to a higher level as the side quests I did gave me more than enough experience, and the exploration often rewarded me with great equipment from chests. Though I wouldn't go against buying equipment, it helps a ton. Same with grinding for levels. I've discussed a lot of positives, but there was one thing that personally felt a little upsetting. I wasn't interested in a new game plus because I thought it would provide the unanswered questions that were left at the end of the game. <laughs> it didn't. For that reason, I didn't play the new game plus. However, it is understandable as the amount of content required to answer the many questions would be at large, and the game itself already has a lot to it. Despite this, my opinion of the game doesn't change in the slightest. It's a fantastic game. With how much it has to offer and how small of an audience it has, it is a hidden gem. For a game at its price point, it is a steal. It is a very challenging game for both its combat and puzzle mechanics, but I absolutely love that about it. If this video has interested you in buying the game, go buy it. I promise it'll be worth the money. Well, that is that. If you've made it to the end, first off, <laughs> I'm very surprised. Second, thank you. It was a long video and I hope you enjoyed it. I wanted to give a special thanks to these people for helping me out for the past several months. It's been really difficult and I wouldn't have made this video without all of you. For the rest, thank you all for watching and take care everyone.